The title of this uh, model is Typologies of Social Policy. In the model, we introduce an important aspect of how we understand the diversity of social policy types. This is important for policymakers and how we think about varieties of social policy frameworks. This concerns the clustering of social policy types that clearly delineate the diversity of norms and modes of provisioning that underpin social policy. The effect of clustering or, or the classification of social policy types is that it introduces us to the idea of social policy architecture. The understanding of the dominant ethos that frame social policy in a given context. This relates to the dominant normative underpinnings of social policy in practice, which highlights the relative coherence within the systems of the design and implementation of social policy. It highlights what is considered the desirable norms underpinning the social policy architecture, the rules of eligibility and access to social provisioning, how social services are delivered, the generosity of the provisions, and so on. Within the social policy literature, this is understood as welfare regime. The nature of a country's social policy architecture, coverage, rules of eligibility, the institutional framework for provisioning, funding, vehicles, as between tax, social insurance, donor support, and so on, and generosity of income replacement will have implications for how a country can respond to the impact of COVID-19 on the lives of on lives and livelihood and how the countries can build back better for an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable post-COVID-19 era. The extent to which the population in a given context is visible and accessible for pre-pandemic social policy architecture and social provisioning will impact the speed and efficiency with which a country can respond to external shocks such as the pandemic. It will also be important for how to build back better for an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable post-COVID-19 era. As Claire Bambra notes, and I quote, welfare state modeling has long been an important strand within comparative social policy, serving as a means of reducing the complexity of cross-national welfare state provisioning, end of quote. Even in the context that may not be clearly understood as rising to the le level of a welfare state, the design and implementation modalities of social policy can be quite diverse and complex across territories. The objective of clustering and highlighting the dominant and salient aspects of a social policy framework is to reduce the complexity of social policy in practice. Generally, the criteria for classifying social policy types or welfare regimes are diverse. These have ranged from addressing how they do it question to the how much question, the institutional characteristics of the welfare systems, the mechanisms for delivering welfare to the gender order and the norms that underpin social policy provisioning. The how they do it question generally speaks to the modalities for funding the social policy provisioning. It matters whether the social policy is funded through tax, 
social insurance or private insurance or whether the tax funded component of social policy provision is universal or selective. In other words, universal in the sense that it covers the whole population or selective in the sense that it covers a designated segment of the population. The how they do it question will relate to the rules that define how those who are eligible are ac can access the social provision. In other words, the eligibility criteria. For a while, the issue of how much dominated the classification of social policy types. This has two distinct and sometimes unrelated components. The first involves indicators based on the share of social expenditure in a country's gross domestic product. As mentioned in module two, within the framework of social statistics that the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD uses, public spending on education is not included in the composition of social expenditure data. A separate way of addressing the how much question is related to the replacement rate of income maintenance measures. For instance, what is the employment, unemployment and sickness benefit as a proportion of the income level of individual beneficiary before being unemployed or falling ill? The institutional characteristics of the welfare system relates to both the selection criteria as well as the ways the delivery of the social welfare is organized. The institutional features concern whether social welfare, education, healthcare, housing, public transport, etc., is organized through public infrastructure or private companies. It also concerns whether this whether something such as social care, child care, old age care is delivered through public institutions, private enterprises, or unpaid family support. The selection criteria acts back to the idea of eligibility criteria. Again, the concern is whether services are provided to everyone within a given territory without discrimination or based on predetermined selective criteria. The former will be considered universal access, while the latter will be regarded as selective. Here, a distinction must be made where the coverage for the social provision is categorical. For instance, child support or old age support services are categorical in that they are explicitly provided based on age limited criteria. One has to be legally a child or an older person to qualify for child support or social pension. This is separate from whether every child or older person is entitled to claim, i.e. universal child support or, social, or universal social pension, or whether entitlement is based on some mean test, e.g. income level of the child caregiver or the older person who is the beneficiary. An essential and vital classification criteria, criterion for social policy or welfare regime types that feminist scholars and activists introduced mainly in the 1990s was a focus on the gender ordering of access and eligibility to welfare provision. This reflects the gender norms that underpin social policy architecture, as we discussed in Model 1. Is the underlying normative assumption of social policy architecture one that assumes that women are homemakers and men a breadwinner, or, or is it one that frames access based on active labor market participation of women and non-gender specific engagement in domestic care activities? In the construction of welfare or social policy regimes, the classification technique may be based on typo typologies or taxonomies. Typologies are generally conceptual classifications 
intended to generate ideal type cases. The most common method used in such a classification process is cluster analysis using quantitative variables. The analysis will generate ideal type cases of clusters to which real existing cases or a country's welfare systems are approximate. The three world welfare state regime cluster that Espen Anderson produced is a case, case, is a case of welfare regimes based on typologies derived from cluster analysis. In this model, we will discuss two examples of such typologies, one by Espen Anderson and the other by Mkandawiri. Most of the classification efforts that emerge in the wake of Espen Anderson's 1990 work are of this type, typologies. A different method of pro producing clusters or social policy regimes is based on taxonomy. Unlike typologies, taxonomies are based on direct observation or clustering of countries or welfare types based on such methods of direct observation. Rather than approximates, countries are a direct representation of the cluster. Most of the feminist responses to Espen Anderson's works and Jeremy Sikin's efforts discussed in this model belong to the taxonomy type of classification. Some of the earliest social policy types discussed in the literature are tax taxonomies of how welfare, social welfare is delivered and the eligibility criteria that frame access and benefit. Richard Titmus made a distinction between eligibility based on universal or selective access. As mentioned above, universal provisioning will involve affording access to everyone without discrimination to the social service. In the case of categorically defined provisioning, child or old age, every child and older person will be eligible to receive the benefit. The same will apply to benefit based on needs unemployment or ill health. Selective access involves limiting access to social services or benefits based on eligibility that can be defined on the basis of means testing. In this context, only people below a particular income level or with assets below a predetermined level will be eligible to access the benefit or service. Selective Techniques may also involve a proxy means test. In some cases, the selection is delegated to the community level where community members are asked to determine those among them that will qualify for accessing the service or benefit. Such proxy means test is used in the context where income-based means test is difficult. In many instances, Selective provisioning of services and benefits are designed to impose significant stigma on beneficiaries so that it will dissuade those who are considered not to be entitled to claim. The removal of stigma is often an impulse for preferences for universal provisioning. Means testing to determine eligibility are also usually intrusive and administratively costly. The level of intrusion into private affairs alone is often enough to discourage many from claiming. In his classic 1958 collection of essays, Essays on the Welfare State, Richard Titmus distinguished between social welfare, fiscal welfare, and occupational welfare. Social welfare or something better classified as public welfare involves social services 
and benefit, benefits provided by the state. This will range from healthcare service to education and income maintenance benefits. The provision will be based on universal access or selectivity. The institutional framing of the social policy provision is that it is provided by public authorities. Fiscal welfare, on the other hand, refers to benefits that are generally provided by tax authorities, something that most people do not really appreciate as being part of the system of social policy provision or social welfare provision. But in the words of Titmos, are nonetheless intended to meet specific needs. This will include tax rebates or tax credit covering a range of needs, child benefit tax credit, tax credit for private medical insurance or pension fund or provident fund contribution are examples of what it must refer to as fiscal welfare. Occupational welfare are generally welfare benefits that accrue to individuals based on their employment and usually provided by employers or employing units. Again, unlike public welfare, occupational welfare is not something that we immediately think of as part of the social welfare apparatus of a country. Occupational welfare covers a range of employment-linked benefits intended to meet specific needs. A measure of social and private health insurance involves contribution by the employer to the insurance premium or in the explicit provision of non-insurance-based health care. Other benefits may include pay-as-you-go retirement benefits or employer's contribution to the pension or provident fund account of an individual employee, support for the education of, of children of employees, clothing allowance, and so on and so forth. The salient point that Titmos makes in the chapter on social division of welfare is that fiscal and occupational welfare have benefits, have different implications for redistribution and inequality. Whereas public universally accessible social services and provisioning are likely to reduce inequality. The other categories of welfare, in particular occupational welfare, tend to deepen inequality. The level of healthy health insurance options and contributions are generally linked to the pay grades of the individual employee. I'm sure that when we consider the peculiar nature of fiscal and occupational welfare to which we depend, it is easy to understand the idea that Africa is a welfare state. It is difficult. It, it is easy to understand that the idea of Africa is a welfare state free region uh, has been absurd. In the posthumous collection of essays, Social Policy and Introduction, Titmus further identified three modes of social policy. These are the residual welfare, the industrial achievement performance welfare, and the institutional redistributive welfare. In cases of residual welfare, public pro provision is provided only in cases of demonstrable inability of the individual to provide for himself or herself. As Titmus noted, and I quote, this formulation is based on the premise that there are two natural or socially given channels through which the, an individual's needs are properly met, the private market and the family. Only when this breakdown should social welfare institution come into play and then only temporarily, end of quote. In this case, the first part of call for individuals to provide for themselves is through the market or the family support. Only in the demonstrable instance of market failure in, in social provisioning where the public authorities provide support. Beneficiaries are often expected to graduate out of the programs. The residual approach is intimately linked to the deployment of selectivity in accessing services and benefits. Titmus Industrial Achievement Performance mode, Model 
is closely related to his early idea of occupational welfare. This model, I quote, incorporates a significant role for social welfare institution as adjunct of the economy. It holds that social needs should be met based on merit, work performance, and productivity, end of quote. The third model that Titmus identifies is what he referred to as the institutional redistributive model of social policy. And I quote from him again, this model sees social welfare as a major integrated institution in society, providing universalist services outside the market on the principle of need. It is in part based on a th or theories about the multiple effects of social change and the economic system and in part on the principle of social equality, end of quote. A central normative inspiration for institutional redistributive model of social policy is <clears throat> the social nature of factors that adversely impact the welfare of individuals in society. What Titmus refers to as diswelfares. For instance, social progress and significant advances in manufacturing capacity have led to a vast number of cars on our roads. Vehicles emit pollutants that can affect the health of individuals. Titmus will argue that the adverse diswelfare of illness that is created by vehicles on the road should be borne collectively by society rather than the individual who falls ill. In other words, the diswelfare of adverse health condition should not be allowed to lie where it falls. An important distinction between the model of social policy that Titmus proposed and the classification types that develop subsequently is that Titmus model can coexist within a single country. While social welfare classification existed before Espin Anderson's three walls of welfare capitalism, the construction of typologies and taxonomies for comparative welfare regime studies exploded following the publication of Espin Anderson's book. As mentioned earlier, Espin Anderson's classification is a work of typology and grounded in cluster analysis. It became a seminal work in the field of comparative social policy analysis. Espin Anderson suggests three distinct welfare regime clusters. These are the liberal, the corporatist, or conservative, and the social democratic welfare regime types. Among the main cluster, main criteria for classification that Espen Anderson used are A, decommodification, the idea that the degree of access to social provisioning is based on social rights linked to citizenship or residence, and the degree of the elimination of market dependence for welfare provisioning. B, social stratification. This welfare regime is not merely a reflection of social stratification, but can deepen or reduce social stratification. And C, the extent of the state's market family mix in the organization of the provision of welfare. The liberal regime takes the market of family as the first port of call, in securing social provisioning. In other words, having access to social services or benefits. The social policy is dominated by individual market-based social insurance, tax subsidies, subsidized private plans, health or old age uh, insurance, uh, pension uh, system for maintenance of uh, income in old age. Uh, public assistance is usually means-tested and stigmatizing. 
In the post-1980s period, this model or approach to social policy, social policy design has become dominant among international multilateral organizations and bilateral donors. The approach to public social policy is mostly residual. The degree of decommodification is small, stratification is maintained and deepened, and states promotes the market as the primary source of welfare provision. This is often supported by tax subsidy or what state most refers to as fiscal welfare. The corporatist conservative regime favors social insurance based entitlements linked to employment status and class. Welfare entitlements are generally first directed at groups whose cooperation in economic modernization and nation building was deemed indispensable by the state. It aligns with Titmos industrial achievement performance model. Social insurance based entitlement is linked to income level and benefits are earnings related. Social insurance may be in separate pools. Private insurance is marginal in this regime. Others refer to, to the corporate welfare regime as Bismarckian regime associated with the social insurance based welfare reforms pioneered by the government of Otto von Bismarck in Germany in the, in the 1880s. In this specific context, the regime preserves the traditional family model of male breadwinner and was influenced by the social conservatism of the church. The social democratic welfare regime is generally identified with universal provision of decommodified services and benefits which seek to incorporate and secure the allegiance of the middle class. It is concerned with promoting equality of access to quality social services and preemptively aims to socialize the cost of family having to provide for care, from child care to social care for the elderly. The social democratic regime is anchored on full employment and the social insurance is, it embodies is of a national insurance type rather than separate pools of funds. The regime is concerned with reducing social stratification and promoting social mobility of lower classes while addressing inequalities in gender relations. In specific contexts, it is associated with active promotion of gender equality and the dual inner family model. In other classifications, such as that by the one by welfare, where Walter Kopi and Joaquin Palmer, the social democratic regime is a close approximate of the encompassing welfare regime. The emphasis in the latter is the comprehensive nature of the coverage of social provisioning that is universal and addresses the vagaries of the market and the life cycles. In other words, what is called from cradle to grave. There have been subsequent attempts to identify other social policy regime types or model uh, to, re, to refine Espinandas' classification types or provide alternative framing for social policy regimes based on substantial disagreements with him on the classification criteria. In the case of the latter, the feminist critique of Espinandas has been based on gender norms that underpin a welfare regime and the take on care economy. Other models have been highlighted that have been highlighted are the productivist Confucian model associated with East Asian countries. In this context, the focus is on raising the productive capacity of citizens 
in which the developmental objectives of the country take precedence. Welfare provisioning is often provided, provided by employing firms or enterprises, and the family plays a prominent role in social provisioning. The nationalist model has been identified in the African context. This is associated with an investment with an investment in human resources capacity through public funding of education facilities, and near universal access to healthcare, subsidies for agriculture, food, and pan-territorial pricing of goods and services. An essential dimension of the nationalist model is a focus on social policies, nation building, or social cohesion task. Welfare regime, whether derived methodologically from a typology or a taxonomy, are approximate. Real existing models are best understood as a welfare regime mix that may have the characteristics of different welfare regimes. There are two significant efforts at identifying welfare or social policy regime types in Africa that are worth discussing further. One is by Jeremy Sikins and the other by Nandikam Kandawiri. Sikins' classification focuses on Latin America and Africa, while Tandika Gandawire's classification focuses on Africa. Sikins derived the classification of three welfare regimes type that he referred to as workerist, agrarian, and pauperist. This classification is based on five criteria, namely, A, the nature of the economy, B, the social character of the working class, C, the nature of the subaltern politics, D, the nature of the strategy adopted by the elite, and E, the discourses and ideology that underpin the attitude towards social welfare. The economy that underpins the workerist regime is import substitution industrialization with the social characteristics of the working class being predominantly foreign immigrant workers. The nature of the subaltern politics underpinning the regime initially involved the extensive use of strikes, but this shifted subsequently to electoral politics. The strategy of the elite was corporatist involving the incorporation of the working class into the dominant political and social system. The ideological underpinning of the workerist regime may be corporatist or social democratic. The regime will involve extensive use of social insurance uh, schemes. In the agrarian welfare regime that seekings argue are characteristic of much of Africa, the economy was primarily dominated by smallholder agriculture. The working class was predominantly made up of migrant workers from the rural areas who were expected to return to the peasant society. The nature of subaltern policy was popular anti-colonialist. The elite strategy in this case, strategy by the colonialist was predominantly one of indirect rule followed by rapid decolonization. The ideological underpinning was conservative or liberal. Much of the social provisioning was left to the families and post-employment income support primarily involved the use of provident fund rather than pension fund types. The third welfare regime that Sikins tagged as populist will seem to have developed much later. Its economic underpinning is export-oriented smallholder commodity production. The character of the working class is made up of rural migrants that do not have any future of going back to being peasant. The mode of subaltern politics is what Sikins labeled as the hidden forms of resistance, but which subsequently morphed into electoral politics. <clears throat> 
The elite strategy involves slow liberal decolonization and the ideological underpinning was liberal or new liberal. <clears throat> A further refinement of the original classification uh, involves the same three types of welfare regimes with five classification criteria. For instance, the peasantry was the focus of the agrarian welfare regime, workers the focus of the workerist uh, regime, and the poor, the paupers, the focus of the pauperist welfare regimes. The incentive for constructing the welfare regimes also differ. The incentive um, in the case of the agrarian regime is to secure social stability, whereas ensuring industrial peace is the incentive for the workerist welfare regime. While social stability in a non-democratic context or gaining an electoral victory in the context of liberal democracy is the incentive for a populist welfare regime. The objective of the agrarian regime is development. While the workerist regime is concerned with smoothening the income of beneficiaries. In each of the regimes, the role of the family, formal wage employment, and the state differ. While the role of the family in the agrarian regime was central, it is marginal in the other two uh, regime types. Formal wage employment is marginal in agrarian and populist regimes, but central in the workerist regime. Similarly, the role of the state is varied um, in the agrarian and workerist regimes, but central uh, in the populist uh, regime. With regards to the nature of the dominant modes of solidarity uh, in the welfare state, kinship defines the agrarian welfare regime while individuals or corporate employment shape the workerist regime and the populist regime is shaped by universal solidarity, mostly one presumes because the benefit of the poor are funded from the fiscals or donor financing. The dominant locus of solidarity also varies between the regime types. Family is the locus of solidarity in the agrarian regime, while market or the state defines the workerist regime and the state undergirds the populist regime. When considered from the perspective of the extent and the direction of redistribution, this is varied under the agrarian regime, low to the poor, but varied to the middle income groups in the workerist regime, and medium to high to the poor in the pauperist regime. In Kandawere's classification of welfare regime models, the concern is with the colonial legacy of welfare regimes. In this regard, Nkandawere builds on the, on the taxonomy of Africa's macro, macro regions that Samir Amin published in 1972. In the publication, Amin identified three macro regimes, namely macro regions, namely what he calls Africa of the colonial trade economy, largely associated with West Africa, dominated by production of cash crops. The second macro region is what Amin refers to as Africa of the concession owning companies, where private mining companies are given concessions to administer the territories and engage in extractive mining activities. Amin associated this macro region with countries in the Congo River Basin from Central African Republic to Democratic Republic of Congo. Amin labeled the third macro region as Africa of the labor reserves associated with settler colonial territories in East and Southern Africa and adjoining labor reserves from where the settler economies extracted migrant workers. Mkandawure's typology was concerned with identifying the labor reserve and macro regions labor reserve macro region has been a social welfare regime that is distinct 
and separate from the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, especially the cash crop macro region or what I mean called Africa of the colonial trade economies. Mkanawere's social welfare typology was also premised on an earlier work on regional differences in tax efforts, i.e. tax receipt as a share of GDP as a colonial heritage. Southern African regions, he argues, demonstrated greater tax efforts than other regions. The classification method used involved cluster analysis, which indicates that trade, in other words, cash crop economies belong in a different cluster from the labor reserves. Then I wouldn't argue that settler economies produced extensive welfare states initially intended for the settlers and administered on exclusively racial lines, but in quote, a quote, which when deracialized provided substantial benefit for those in ex included in the welfare work, in this welfare work, end of quote. In this regime, social expenditure is mostly funded from domestic resources mobilization and in linking the regime types to tax efforts, argues that inherited institutions for tax mobilization and welfare expenditure persisted into the settler, post-settler context. The salient characteristics of the cash crop economies are that unlike in the labor reserve settler economies, land and the production systems were left mainly in the hands of the indigenous population. Tax efforts were limited to the collection of poll tax and trade tax levied on export of cash crops. This spillover into a significant informal economy and low welfare spending uh, um, here. Uh, and here, Mkandawire was referring to social protection spending. This would be similar to Sikkim's agrarian welfare regimes. Applied to the health expenditure profiles, of the different regions between cash crop macro region and labor reserve macro regions. Mkanda Wire argues that, and I quote, labor reserves economies have much higher levels of payment than prepaid private plans, from prepaid private plans than non-labor reserve economies, and hence have much less out-of-pocket expenditure as percentage of private expenditure on health, end of quote. Limitations of welfare regime typology and taxonomies. The classifications generated in the efforts at creating typologies and taxonomies of welfare regimes is essential in making sense of distinct clusters of normative and institutional underpinnings or welfare provisioning. Espen Anderson's welfare regime types, for instance, offer significant insight for policymakers in understanding specific types and implications of different welfare regimes, not merely as reflection of social stratification, but to the extent to and but the extent to which particular types of welfare regimes can reinforce or transform existing social uh, stratification. However, typology construction is often limited by the social policy instruments that are included in the cluster analysis. As mentioned in module two, a limitation of Espen Anderson's typology is that it focuses almost exclusively on income maintenance or income replacement instruments. The danger is that 
quite often typology construction tends to reduce social policy to social protection and then focus on those e easily measurable transfers in cash. While, in, while the scholars involved are aware of the broader social policy instrument, the methodological limitations might ignore important inflections or sub-levels sub of welfare provisioning. For instance, while the, while the UK is classified with the liberal welfare regime, its healthcare provision and institutional arrangement are closer to the social democratic regime. For instance, concerning Africa, if we take on board the provision of education services, the role of the state will be more ex extensive than the typologies based on income maintenance will suggest. In 1993, for instance, public spending on education in Madagascar was 51.5% of total education spending. In 1998, in the Benin Republic, public spending was 55.6%. In much of the 2000 household expenditure on education as a percentage of total spending uh, was as low as 0.6% in Rwanda, 1.8% in Zambia, Nowhere did the household spending account for 44% or more. A further concern is that typologies tend to treat welfare regimes and welfare arrangements, especially the social democratic model, in what Joran Terbon described as a state of culmination an end point in the development of a system of welfare, social welfare. Typologies are often derived from a snapshot picture of the welfare uh, systems at a specific moment in time. It will miss the evolution of the system beyond the particular moment in time. Social policy regimes can degrade or improve. These are almost always an outcome of contending social forces in a society seeking to shape the system of welfare provisioning. For policymakers concerned with enhancing the well-being of their people, there are as many lessons to be learned in studying the evolution of a welfare regime as in understanding its shape at specific moments in time. What social questions were the designers of a system trying to address? How did they seek to address the questions? What social forces were contesting in the shaping of the eventual outcome of the welfare system? Above all, it is important to keep in mind that a social policy regime is subject to constant contestation and stress testing. We we'll now shift our attention to the diversity of, of instruments. Above all, it is essential to be aware of the diversity of social policy instruments available to policymakers. The diversity of funding and delivery mechanism and the diversity of coverage, generosity and provision and the nature of the social intention that shapes social policy architecture. The social policy instrument available to policy makers range from education to health and sanitation, housing, land and, and agrarian policies, labor market, affirmative action, mm -hmm. family support, family policies, child support policy, old age policy. Every policy instrument intended to enhance the well-being of people in a territory will count for social policy instrument. Even subsidies and pricing of services in a manner that mitigates the vagaries of the market, such as pan-territorial pricing. It is equally important to be aware 
of the diversity of funding and delivery mechanism for social welfare. The funding mechanisms range from tax funded instruments to social insurance, individual private insurance, the use of sovereign wealth funds, out of pocket spending and donor financing. But there are reverse directions of social policy financing mechanisms. For instance, social insurance different and distinct from market-based individual insurance in the area of pension fund, for example, can be source of financing development activities and investment. For example, pension funds, social insurance base were used in Finland for financing national infrastructure in the 1950s. In South Korea, pension funds were used for, to finance the chemical industry and infrastructure. What is essential to keep in mind is that the funding mechanism that becomes dominant will have consequences on the capacity of public authorities to mobilize the people for development purposes. It, is, it has implications for the nature of society that is being built. It has implications for whether a country is committing to a residual social policy architecture or a more encompassing one. Delivery mechanism will also range from public institutions or publicly mandated bodies, market, family, or community. Again, the choice of delivery mechanism matters. It matters for resource mobilization, the capacity of public authorities to use the multiple tasks of social policy, and whether the social policy can effectively contribute to, contribute to the nation building or social cohesion project of, of a country. Coverage matters in framing and, and the delivery of the social intention of social policy. Coverage that is universal or involves an essential universal provision with a second tier targeting to cover hard to reach groups and communities matters in diverse task tasking of social policy. Universal provisioning is more likely than not to underpin a social intention of social transformation and building social cohesion. These are important in the area of education and healthcare service, services provision. The ability of a social policy instrument to reduce poverty rather than simply alleviating poverty is more a function of the generosity of the social provisioning than the simple act of providing. Poverty alleviation strategies are concerned with the relief of poverty, although the total number of people in poverty may not reduce. A social assistance instrument that covers only a fraction of the resources needed to meet the basic consumption needs may alleviate poverty, but it cannot reduce it. Residual and stigmatizing systems of provision have tended to be inadequate for the beneficiaries and create resentment among non-beneficiaries whose taxes fund the social assistance. It is essential to be aware that funding mechanisms, coverage levels, the generosity of provision and the delivery mechanisms all affect the social intention underpinning the social welfare systems. It is the difference between a welfare system intended for system maintenance and another intended for social and economic transformation. Underpinning all this is the extent to which human worth and rights define the norms that frame the social policy architecture. I thank you.